Hello, everybody, and welcome to our speaker series with 42 Courses. My name is Louise Ward, and you are very welcome. And I'm so glad that so many of you have joined us today to meet our special guest, hear the wisdom of the words of Bob Hoffman. Now, Bob Hoffman is a legend name in the advertising world. But of course, I don't know if all of you are in the advertising world and if you are familiar with Bob, I'm presuming that's why you've joined us today. Bob is the founder of one of the leading independent advertising agencies in the US, self-titled Chief Aggravation Officer. He's the author of five books, bestsellers in Amazon and the super blog Ad Contrarian, which if you don't already subscribe to, what have you been doing? I absolutely advise <laughs> that you go away and subscribe now. Um, his most recent newsletter, you would so enjoy, The Blindness of Visionaries. It's extremely topical, everything that's going on at the moment. So, Bob Hoffman, you are very welcome to join us in the 42 oh, Courses God. Speaker Series. Thank you, Louise. It's very nice to be here. Oh, so, yeah. Bob, for those of them who have joined us today, uh, I'm just going to a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off, which is just to but ask you all, if you don't mind, to mute yourselves. Yeah. And what we'll be doing is we'll be having a chat about Bob's book for the next sort of 25 or 30 minutes. And then I can just see somebody uh, isn't on mute. Uh, but if you could all mute yourselves, thank you. And uh, then do in your chat, tell us where you're joining us for, for joining us from. And also, if you have questions for Bob, please put them into the chat and we will come to you in about 30 minutes. So, Bob, for those of them who are joining us who don't know about you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Bob? OK, I spent about 40 years or so in the advertising agency business. And I was the chief executive of three agencies. I retired from the agency business nine years ago. And since then, I have been writing and speaking about advertising. Before I got into advertising, I was a teacher. I was a science teacher for a few years. I was the world's worst teacher. Um, and teachers, as you know, are... Uh, they are patient and they are nurturing, and I am neither patient nor nurturing. But uh, I got into advertising, and I had a very nice career in advertising. And um, But uh, since I retired, I've been speaking and writing about some of the issues that I think are very important to the advertising and marketing industry that I don't think are being addressed sufficiently by our industry. And you've written a series of books, the second to this last one, we're going to be talking today about AdScan, your newest book. But am I right in thinking that the one prior to this was sort of building along the same lines into this theme, Bob? Actually, uh, two books ago, I wrote uh, a book called Bad Men that was um, uh, about the same theme about the uh, difficulties and indiscretions and dangers of what's going on in advertising. Uh, and th this new book, Ad Scam, looks at those issues five years later and what has happened after five years of um, our industry doing nothing about problems that uh, have been plaguing us and have been plaguing society, I think. And um, as I said to Bob when we met for our chat yesterday, I've absolutely bored the pants off anybody who'd give me uh, bandwidth to talk about this book because it's one of those books that when you read it, it really gets under your skin and it seems to beg a belief that this business is carrying on. So we're talking today about Bob's book, Ad Scam. How online advertising gave birth to one of history's greatest frauds and became a threat to democracy, which they're strong words, but it's kind of true, isn't it, Bob? I think it's quite true. And uh, I think that we are, uh, those of us in the advertising and marketing industries have been uh, willfully ignorant 
of some of the damage that we've been doing. And uh, we need to wake up and we need to uh, we need to understand what's happening and figure out what we're going to do about it. OK, so in your book, you address this issue in three sort of sections. You first talk about the danger. Then the middle section is called fraud and the third section partners in crime. And uh, in a very loose summary, uh, you talk about three troubling aspects of online advertising, how it has contributed to this wedge that's developed in politics, how it enables the transfer of money to criminal enterprises, and then finally, how you feel that advertising leaders have turned a blind eye to the damage that's done by tracking based marketing analytics and you particularly single out Facebook. Yeah, uh, there are uh, a number of important issues that um, have been raised by tracking, online tracking of us. And as those of you in the advertising business know, the essence of online advertising, the, the engine of online advertising is based on tracking, tracking people, which we never did before. In, in advertising for decades, we targeted people based on non-personal kinds of information, demographics and stuff like that. But uh, the online advertising industry tracks us all, everything we do, everywhere we go, everyone we speak to, and um, bases advertising targeting on that tracking. And that tracking has led to a lot of unintended consequences, um, one of which is that information about us is being shared widely throughout the world uh, with dangerous people that we don't know and we have no control over. And, and uh, and it has created wedges in our society. And um, a second issue is fraud. Uh, we, we don't know for sure, but we the best estimates are that somewhere about $60 billion or more of advertising dollars uh, online are being stolen and used for who knows what purposes, but mainly we must assume nefarious purposes by organized criminals, by uh, unfriendly governments. And uh, the sad part is there's virtually no, um, there, are, there are no penalties for being an online ad fraudster. Uh, nobody keeps track of who's doing what. There's no regi international registry of fraudsters where criminals go to tell us how much money they've stolen. And we don't know what's going on with that money, but we can assume it's probably um, used for uh, drugs. Uh, it's probably used by unfriendly governments to um, do things that we don't like in our in our societies. Um, and uh, you know we we can't know for sure because the whole online ecosystem is so murky and so hard to understand what's going on that even the people who participated in it every day don't know what's going on. So it's, uh, there's that part of it. And the, the other part that you mentioned, Louise, is that our, our industry itself, the leaders of our, the so-called leaders of our industry, uh, seem to turn a blind eye to it. And I, I think we are, um, we are sleepwalking into a nightmare. We, you know, th there is so much information being collected about us and shared with so many people that we don't know. Uh, but we do know, we're starting to know what happens when, when marketers have all this information. You know, we know historically when political entities, when governments, knew everything about us, knew who we talked to, knew what we said, knew where we went and where we were at all times. This was very dangerous for individuals. Uh, we, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the KGB and the Stasi and the uh, Gestapo knew everything about everyone in their societies. And we know what that led to. We, we don't know what happens when marketers have all this information, but we're starting to learn. 
Um, and uh, it's not healthy and it's not going any place good, I think. And we need to uh, be a little more careful about how we're doing business in the advertising industry because we are collecting way too much information about individuals. It's dangerous and it's not healthy for democratic institutions. I'm seeing a few comments there that you're preaching to the converted here, Bob. So we've got a lot of like-minded people joining us today. At the start of the book, when you're talking about ad tech and targeting ads, you say that the ad industry made a number of disingenuous assertions that the free internet is reliant on surveillance for revenue. And you say, no, we're reliant on advertising, not surveillance. Yeah. And that they say tracking is necessary for relevant ads. And you say, no, 80% of us, well, certainly figures in the US, choose not to be tracked. So there's a lot of claims being put out there that you feel are not accurate. Yeah, we, we have to acknowledge that the, uh, the money for the online advert, uh, for the, the money for the uh, web is provided by advertising to a, to a great extent. That's where websites, that's how they can provide us information and entertainment and communication options like this for free is because they make money from advertising. But they don't make money from tracking. Um, the advert, the uh, media industry has been supported by advertising for decades without tracking people. And we have proven to be very, very good at, at targeting advertising at people without tracking them. So the idea that somehow the online industry is different from the rest of, me, uh, of the media and needs to spy on people in order to, to do advertising effectively, I think is disingenuous. I think it's not true. And, um, but that's the excuse they use. And there's a lot of technical terms when we start talking about this area of, uh, well, I, I'm saying surveillance, it does feel very KGB, but there's lots of things you talk yeah. about RTB, real-time bidding, you talk about the illegality of pop-ups and how fines just aren't relevant when the companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're so big that fines yeah. really don't have any relevance to them. Yeah, I'm going to get my numbers wrong here, but it's about like this. Um, this week, Google was fined $397 million for its uh, illegal tracking of people. Um, and uh, this is a $1.3 trillion company being fined $397 million which is about the equivalent of a $1.3 million company being fined $391. So uh, as you can see, these fines are a joke. To, to these companies, it, it's just the cost of doing business. They, um, they, they do their criminal activities, they get fined, and they move on. And uh, there, is no, there, there will not be any consequences to these fines until these people are either made to pay really substantial money by themselves, not corporately, but personally, or until someone goes to jail. Then the laws will start to be enforced. Then the, then the laws will start to be uh, abided by. Right now, they really don't care. It's not that big a deal to them to pay, uh, you know, a, a tiny little fine by their standards and keep on doing what they're doing. And that comparison in the percentage with the figure that you stated just really makes it shocking. What I loved about the book and anyone who's familiar with uh, Bob's work or with his blog will know that he doesn't mince his words. Uh, yeah. And that really is almost sort of the joy of the book that you're just so sort of sure of your feelings about it you say that tracking based ad tech industry is a criminal racket of epic proportions i mean it's dramatic words but it's a dramatic situation when you talk actually in the sec the second section about ad fraud 
yeah. you open quite early on and you say that online advertising is so complex, it's indecipherable to almost everyone. Yeah, there, and, you know, maybe there are 10 people in the world who really understand what's going on under the hood of programmatic advertising. Uh, the rest of we think we know what's going on, but we don't. And uh, it's so complex. You have to, it, 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 if you're buying programmatic advertising uh, and you want to see what's actually happening, you have to be either a computer scientist or a software engineer to get under the hood of every website that the programmatic system is putting your ads on and get under the hood and look at the code to see what well, are you really talking to people or are you talking to bots are you really on a website or are you on something that looks like a web that's fooling you into thinking it's a website and and a study by the isba the um incorporated society of british advertisers uh last year or maybe it was 2020 found that the average online advertiser who uses the programmatic ad system and is a quality advertiser uh, will find their ads, uh, the programmatic system places their ads on average on 40,000 websites. Now, how in the world are you supposed to look at 40,000 websites to see if your ad actually ran, if it's actually a website, or if actual people came there. It's, uh, it's an impossibility. So what happens is, instead of getting firsthand knowledge of what's happening with your advertising budget in programmatic advertising, you get reports. And the reports are often generated by the DSPs and the SSPs, and they are completely untrustworthy, in my opinion. Um, the uh, uh, in the book, I wrote about uh, what I call an unintentional research project in which some people found that billions of ads that were supposed to be in, run in one place were run in completely other places for nine months for major brands, and none of the brands knew it. Now, presumably, over that nine-month period, they were getting reports telling them that their ads were running well and that they were, you know, getting the uh, value that they were expecting to get from their ads. And it all turned out to be bullshit. It was all a lie. So um, not only is the... Not only is the buying of, of advertising online uh hard to keep track of in a rational sense we rely on reports that are unreliable uh to 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 tell us that we're getting good stuff so the the whole thing is very uh, opaque very hard to know what's going on and um it's uh there's a lot of money being thrown away by brands who don't realize how much fraud uh, and how much money is 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 not being used in a uh, e efficient and effective way programmatically. I mean, those facts are quite shocking. And this confusion and people not being able to understand really even the field they're working in, it reminded me so much of when I've read about finance, financial packages that were created and that really they were working them every day but didn't actually understand how it was going on. Um, I mean, A very good analogy, you know, um, when, when we had the subprime mortgage explosion in 2008, up until the time that Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, everyone thought it was great. You know, this week, uh, you know, FTX, Every this guy was a hero, a billionaire, a genius. All of a sudden, it turns out he was a fraud, and uh, nobody knew about it. And in, the difference is in the uh, in the subprime mortgage issue, uh, and in the FTX issue with cryptocurrencies. There's a big event, and the uh, like. Lehman goes out of business, and FTX files for bankruptcy. And there's a big event that tells us all, "Oh, this was a scam." Now I get it. In the online advertising world, there's never a big event like that. It's just one brand after another is wondering, how come my stuff? I, I read all these miracles, 
in the trade press about how effective this is. How come my stuff isn't that effective? How come I'm not? How come these miracles don't apply to me? And it's quiet, and nobody wants to publicize their failures. So there's no real big event that tells everyone, "Oh, this is bullshit." Mm. Yeah. When you're talking about the fraud in the book, you uh, quote a web security company, and they said. Yeah that there's more traffic on the web from malignant bots than from human beings. And further on, yeah, it's amazing. And further on, you say that online fraud has overtaken credit card fraud. I mean, they're just, just amazing facts to be shared in this way. Yeah. There are, there are three kinds of activities on the web. There's benign bots and benign bots are bots that just are search, you know, finding out, data for you know uh, media people and they don't do any harm they're just checking on stuff then there's malignant bots try, people you know trying to ex- uh, get money from us for you know f- commit fraud and then there's human activity and there there's more activity among malignant bots than among humans on the web which is it's an absolute mind blower uh, but uh, these people are researchers and uh, you have to uh, give them some credit for knowing what's going on. And you mentioned before the dollar spend. Um, you also state another thing in the middle of this book. Um, the ANA say that of $200, $200 billion ad spend on programmatic advertising in the U.S., only 60 billion reaches a human. You know, still talking about this bot business and not, I mean, it's just, they're extraordinary figures, aren't they, Bob? Yes, they are. And, um, and you no, say but, uh, 70% evaporates, which just made me yeah, laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nobody knows where the other 140 billion go. Now, it is presumed, and once again, I'm going to go back to the ISBA in the UK. They have uh, calculated that 50% of all Uh, programmatic ad dollars go to middlemen and then there's um the other um 20 percent or so that is probably going to fraud we don't know for sure but uh you know 70 percent is disappearing and uh, nobody knows where so it's uh it's uh it's a mess and People on this call today must be sort of scratching their heads and just saying, how and why is this able to carry on? But as you say, the prosecution for ad fraud is non-existent. Yeah, there's no penalties for it, essentially. Nobody, very rarely does anyone get prosecuted for ad fraud. And if they do, so, so let's say we find out that, that uh, in North Korea or in Russia, there are fraudsters stealing tens of billions of dollars from the online ecosystem. What are we going to do about it? There's, you know, it's not. It's probably not even against the law there. So what are we going to do? Uh, there are no penalties for it. There are no remedies for victims. And I think you possibly touched on this before, but this is the case that I bore the pants off people with. But it's the famous Chase Bank story yeah. that you have in your book which yeah. is uh i don't know if i'll get this right they reduced they looked at their ad spend and they reduced the ad sites from four hundred thousand dollars i can't remember what the period of time was to five thousand quite a reduction reduced by you say 99 percent, and they saw no difference in their performance no, it wasn't dollars. Was, it was sites. They, it was they were 400,000 four, sites. They were advertising on 400,000 sites. It, yeah. They reduced it to 5,000 sites and saw no difference. So in other words, 99% of the sites that they were using were probably uh, contributing nothing. But an interesting one about the dollar value, um, I don't remember if this is in the book or not, but uh, Uber was spending $150 million a year uh on online advertising and they uh took away two-thirds of the money and found no difference in uh 
ineffectiveness. And, and that was due to what is called attribution fraud, where um, sites that were claiming to be sending customers to Uber actually weren't. They were finding customers who went to Uber and then taking credit for those customers having gone there post facto. So another uh, section from the book that I just want to refer to, and I think, sorry, this is the story you were alluding to um, yeah. earlier on in our conversation, is the information from Adalytics. I can't remember the name of yes. the two guys. Yeah. Early 2022, they discovered that a uh, publishing company were publishing online ads in the wrong places. Yep. Billions of adverts had run in the wrong places, but not a single brand noticed their ads were not where they were supposed to be. And we're not talking about small companies here. No. We're talking about Nike, Adidas. Right. We're talking about Ford, Starbucks. Not one of them had got right. in touch to say, yeah. where Suppo are our ads? Supposedly sophisticated advertisers had no idea that their ads were not running where they were supposed to be running for nine months. Billions of ads. Uh, the the brand people didn't know it the media people didn't know it the um nobody knew it and uh and you know you have to assume that they were getting reports saying yeah oh our ads are running oh look how good we're getting this and we're getting that we've all seen those reports and uh you know they just these researchers just stumbled on this by accident they stumbled on this and uh, you'd think it would make huge waves in the advertising and you'd think there would have been headlines in campaign magazine and in and in the business section of newspapers and in advertising age here in the US and nothing. It was like a whisper. It wasn't a big deal. So, so what happens is what we're reading in the ad trade press, what we what we read in the business section of newspapers, what we see on television business reports, and what we listen to in webinars and, you know, conferences like this, is the 0.1% of, of um, case histories that are successful. The 99.9% .9 of people who don't have hugely successful uh, marketing and advertising activity, they shut up. They don't want their, they don't want their failures to be broadcast and publicized. So all we hear are the very small tip of the iceberg success stories. That's what we read about in the trade publication. We wonder how come we're not, how, how come these miracles don't work for us? And the answer is because there are two or three standard deviations from normal. The, the, you know, the, the, the real story in marketing is usually the untold story. It's the story of the mass number of marketers who aren't having spectacular results. The only results we hear about are the spectacular ones. Mm -hmm. We've talked about general advertising, uh, but there's no doubt that the thread throughout a lot of your book is your strong feelings about Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and towards the end of the book in the third section, you talk a lot about Facebook fakery. Um, yeah. And um, as you say, tracking is essential to these big three, Facebook, yeah. Amazon, Google, because, I mean, essentially you say they own web advertising. So they don't know, just own web advertising. They own the web. I mean, the web was supposed to be a democratizing influence on society. If you go back uh, 10 or 15 years and you read the literature of our industry, the web was going to change everything. Everyone was going to be able to speak to everyone. And, you uh, you know, the big company, the advantage of being a big company was going to be taken away because anyone could. Well, it has had the exact opposite effect. It has concentrated so much power into the hands of so few people. Uh, you know, basically, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, a few more, um, it, they have so much power now that they can snub their nose at governments. They don't, they don't care what, gov what government regulators say. Yeah, find me. See what I care about that.
Uh, so uh, we have a we have too much power in too few hands. We have too much power in the hands of too few uh, companies, organizations, and particularly one industry, the mm -hmm. technology industry, and it's not healthy. And we all know the sort of woes that are going on in the Twitterverse at the moment. Um, yep. You do talk about Twitter, in particular, looking at Twitter bots, where you say that 10% of Twitter accounts were bots. I mean, I think we're not now that we're, you know, we're reading about it all the time. We're not surprised to uh, read that particular fact. But I think the yep. fact that really... Um, concerned me was when it sunk in you said you know talking back about Facebook even Facebook doesn't have control over the data it holds and the disorder in its own house which is really worrying yeah we we, we you know everything that we've ever been told about privacy about data privacy and data security in the fullness of time has turned out to be complete bullshit None of it's none of it's true, and um, these big companies are they're making tons of money from it. It's and uh, no one is controlling it. And uh, Facebook is my favorite target because they're the biggest liars. I mean, their lies are so obvious, and so it, it, it's amazing to me the things that they say in public that are such obvious lies, I can only imagine what they tell their clients in private. If, if, if in public, I, I mean, in the book, I, I have some claims about who their audiences are. That, you know, uh, one example, in the U.S., they say they reach, uh, I think it's 41 million people between the ages of 20 and 29. Well, only 31 million people exist between that age. How do they reach 41 million of them? That's, a, that's an amazing uh, achievement on their part. But they, they do lies like this all the time and get away with it in public. You can only imagine what they say in private to their um, naive customers. There's lots of uh, comments there in the chat, the amazement at some of the things we're talking about, a couple saying that they're going to order the book, you will enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the so, nice thing about, I'm sorry, can I plug the book for a second? Of course, go ahead. The nice thing about it is it's only 100 pages. I didn't want to do like a scholarly academic 500 page thing that bores everyone to death. Instead, I wanted to make it more impressionistic so you can read about this essay and that essay and this essay and that, and you can get a sense for what's going on without having to, to slog through 500 pages of, uh, of details. So I, I, I'm hoping it's more accessible to people like me who are impatient and want to get to the heart of the, the issue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it definitely is. It's a slim book, but it's yeah. it's all meat. It's, you know, there's, there's no nonsense in there. So towards the end, obviously, yeah. you know, you, you put forward your argument. And in your final summary, you say it comes down to two words, spam tracking. Yeah, tracking is the problem. And um, it's the first thing, you know, the, the problems of the web can't be solved. You can't just snap your fingers and it's all going to go away. But the first thing that has to happen, if we are going to solve some of these problems, the first thing that has to happen is we have to ban tracking. We can no longer allow these companies to follow us everywhere we go without our permission um, and uh, keep track of us and have secret files on us uh, that we know nothing about and that we can't access, that has to end. If that ends, a lot of these problems become attenuated. And from there, we can make some significant changes. But until tracking is banned, this is going to continue, in my opinion. So I am going to start coming to your some some of the questions that have been posted by people who joined us. 
uh, for this chat. So if you've got any questions for Bob, do pop them in there and we'll try to get to all of them. And try Just... to keep them easy, please. <laughs> no, no, no difficult questions. That, that, that was my deal with Louise. She said, I promise you, Bob. <laughs> So just finally, before I finish up with you, Bob, um, do you ever feel a little sort of alone in your very, very big argument, you know, very big task, taking on I, the world I, I, <laughs> with I, this I, problem? I used to. When I first started writing about this, like 12 years ago, I was considered an idiot. I was uh, out of touch. I was a Luddite dinosaur who didn't understand it. You know, and for kind of 10 years I was that way I was the idiot in the corner screaming while everyone was saying would you shut up you know but in the last five years or so I think enough of what I was screaming about has come to pass and has been shown to be true that I no longer feel alone I think there are uh, a substantial number you know not as many as I would like, but a substantial number of people who are coming to the same conclusions that I came to, which is that this is very dangerous and we need to do something. And uh, unfortunately, we have regulators and legislators who uh, are busy with their own egos and their own personal uh, problems to really take much of this seriously. Although I do have to say over there in Europe, uh, there is a lot more uh, sensitivity to this issue and a lot more maturity about this issue than there is here in the States. So I am, I'm not completely without hope that we can do something. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm, you know, I've been yelling about this for a long time and I'd love to see a little more movement toward some sensible policies than we currently have. And it is something I presume that you think it's like it's for government to intervene. I, I would love if they didn't intervene. I would love if we were mature enough, if we were responsible enough as an industry to do it ourselves. But clearly we are not. And we've had the chance and uh, we have done absolutely nothing. And so it's time for mom and dad to step in and say, you know, you got to stop uh, these bad habits you have. Uh, I'm not. I'm not the kind of person who believes that governments need to be involved in every aspect of our lives. I, 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 that's not really my point of view about most things. But in this case, we have proved to be completely irresponsible, and someone has to. Someone has to take the lead on this, and it ain't going to be us. <laughs> Okay, well, it's been really great uh, picking your your brains and talking My to you. My tiny after, little brain, yeah. <laughs> after having read the book, and uh, I was so delighted when you agreed to join me. So uh, I'm just going to turn to the questions now. And there's a question from uh, Harmony. Uh, Harmony is actually a friend of mine from Behavioral Science Club. Harmony, you're very welcome here for this 42 Courses speakers event and uh, you put a couple of questions in the chat so Harmony I'd love it if you would join us there now and put your question to Bob you're very welcome Harmony. Hi Louise thank you Bob yeah this is great as I said before you are preaching to the choir <laughs> to sort of have this uh, map of all of these things that have gone wrong you know really for me the uh, I'd say 2016 with the, um, you know, the Cambridge Analytica um, situation, which really using all of this data, um, you know, it was really sort of creepy. I don't think that that really came to light as much as it, as it should have. But I suppose for me, when I think about tracking and all of the sort of glitzy and glamorous technology in a way, I mean, it's really exciting, you know. Um, I do, I've taken a couple of online advertising classes and one was with um, this guy in Norway who does these heat maps, you know, and he's quite active on LinkedIn. I mean, it's really exciting to kind of see what, you know, you think 
most everyone is looking at in the image and you can kind of follow along and it's um I wonder to what extent the excitement and almost a voyeurism you know let's be frank I mean when we have these types of positions and we're we have access to this really sensitive information I wonder if that's part of the problem you know that the people within the industry themselves aren't sort of you know sort of self maybe managing their own because it is exciting I think as well from like an individual level, I mean, I wonder if, you know, we all can kind of see the benefits of so much of the technology and we all just sort of, we don't want to, we don't want to sort of try to separate and, like, and say, well, yes, I like this part of technology. And there's this general acceptance of it. As you were saying, governments, I think even governments are, are overwhelmed by it. You know, we sort of saw Mark Zuckerberg being interviewed and, you know, they, this cap, you know, Capitol Hill is just completely incompetent in terms of being able to even just see an FTX. You know, I'm on a bandwagon with that in our behavioral <laughs> science group, really like Come you'll, on, you'll love that uh, was... Bob's Bob's recent newsletter harmony yes, on that subject. I'm, I'm going to read that for yeah. sure. Would I you mean, like to address on. the question there now, Bob? Yeah, the um, we have fallen in love with the technology, yeah. and we have forgotten about what some of the unintended consequences of the technology have been. And yeah, it's exciting to see the heat maps and then this and then that. But uh, since when did the um, since when did the convenience of marketers become more important than the integrity of democratic institutions? The answer is not even close. And uh, we need to protect our individual rights and liberties from these people who may be getting a huge charge out of following everything we do, but have no right to do that, in my opinion. And uh, we need to get them off our backs. Yeah, well stated. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Harmony, you sound like a Yank, are you? I am. I'm from San Francisco originally. Get out of here. I transplant. Yeah. I'm in okay. Oakland. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Harmony. A little bit of bonding there with Bob. That's yeah. lovely. So I'm just going into the chat there. Ron has said he's ordered the book. Well done, Ron. <laughs> and Declan there now has said he'll definitely be reading the book, Bob, Marissa saying she now needs to go and read the case studies. There's some great, uh, great research studies in the book. And Philip saying it's crazy that no one talks about this or knows anything about it. And I mean, that is kind of, obviously that's the problem, Bob. But what you say is that the reason nobody talks about it is because almost people working in that area don't like to admit that they don't understand the technology they're dealing with there's that and also there's the fact that they make money from it now look if you're if you're ad age magazine if you're campaign magazine or if you're i don't know what the magazines over where you are are uh, ad week magazine most of your conferences are sponsored by Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple and all the ad tech companies you don't want to piss them off you don't want to have, you don't want to invite me to come there and talk to your conference and piss off the people who are sponsoring you. So you don't hear that and you don't see it in their, in, 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 in the magazines and you don't see it in the newsletter. Here's an, here's an, another amazing uh, statistic. Uh, Facebook did a study in 2018. Facebook executives themselves, they wanted to know what effect their algorithms had on their on their users and they did a study and they found out that about two-thirds of people who joined extremist groups on facebook joined those groups because they were sent there by facebook as recommended groups that they should join Two thirds of people who joined extremist groups of all stripes were sent there by Facebook's algorithms. And where where do the algorithms derive their information from tracking, from the from the data they collect from tracking? So, prima facie evidence that the wedges being driven into society by extremist organizations are being 
substantially and significantly achieved through the use of algorithms by social websites. So there's a question now in the chat from Dell Blaze. I don't know if you're still with us, Dell, uh, and you're talking about dealing with secondary data. Would you like to put the question yourself to Bob, or will I read the question there now if you're still with us, Dell? I'll just start. You can unmute yourself if you want to join me. So Dell's saying when dealing with secondary data, usually provided by these tech giants, it's usually best to counter check by conducting a primary research to rule out the possibility of deviations being presented as normal. I think we, you know, we we sympathize and understand in terms of doing counter checking. But as you say, Bob, the problem with the research that we're given is these figures are so enormous that it turns out that even the people providing them with it don't seem to <laughs> understand it. It's just this, you know, the big mass of confusion. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an, I'm an advertising, I'm a copywriter. I'm not an expert on data. I'm not an expert on research. But what I do know is that a lot of what passes for research in our field is uh, highly questionable. And you have to be very careful about whose research you believe and what research you believe. And, uh, you know, you, you, if you're an advertiser, you need a really smart research person to tell you what's real and what's bullshit. Uh, you know, that's my point of view. I, I could never do that. I don't have training in research. You know, I'm a writer. But uh, I always try to surround myself with people who I thought knew their field well and could tell me what was real and what was not real. Because in, in the advertising business, you know, creatively, we know there's good creative work and there's bad creative work. And, but we don't assign the same kind of attributes to marketing and, and research and media. There's good media and bad media. There's good research and bad research. There's good marketing ideas and bad marketing ideas. And you have to have people who, who really know what they're doing to advise, if you're a decision maker, to advise you on what to believe and, and what to do. Um, Ron, you've got a question in the chat. I can see you there now. You're still with us, Ron. Would you like to unmute yourself and put your nice succinct question uh, to Bob? Okay, thanks very much. Um, I've got a lot of questions, an okay. awful lot of questions. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, your book will help me understand quite a lot of aspects of this. I suppose apocalyptically if nothing is done where does this all lead what's our Apo worst case scenario before we find out what the best case scenario is okay the, the worst case scenario i can only talk for what i see here in the us i really don't know what i, I don't want to pretend to be an expert on things i, I have no knowledge of but here here in the us worst case scenario is civil war uh we are we are we are driving so many people apart uh, through the collection of data and integrating that data into algorithms and algorithms that are used to um, uh, to create different realities for different groups of people. Uh, you know, your Facebook page is completely different from my Facebook page. It's based on what Facebook thinks you're going to be interested in. And my Facebook page is based on what Facebook thinks I'm going to be interested in. And your Facebook ta pa page tends to reinforce your prejudices uh, with, uh, with collections to people and stories that are going to engage you and keep you on the site. And my page is going to do the exact same thing for me. And so I, I am, I am learning different facts than you are learning. They may not all be facts, but they're presented as facts by the people who are, who, who we are being connected to. And uh, at some point there will be, there will be a tipping point at which we can no longer speak uh rationally to one another and uh that has quickly approached here in the u.s it's very hard there used to be a time you know i'm a very old guy and there was a time i can remember when conservatives and liberals could you know of people of goodwill could have a 
you know, could disagree in a, in a civil fashion. That's gone. Now people just yell at each other and call each other names. And uh, that's not healthy. And so, you know, uh, the apocalyptic version of that here in the U.S., I think, is some kind of civil war. It may not be the kind of civil war we're used to where, you know, we're shooting at each other. It may be the kind of civil war where, uh, you know, with our, our system of government is so screwed up. We have 50 states and these states may do this kind of thing and those states may do that kind of you know that a different kind of civil war than we're used to um uh worldwide the apocalyptic you know the really bad part is that governments become more and more authoritarian they know more and more about us it you know the world becomes like china is now where everyone is watched every minute of the day where uh you are raided on your um on your, uh, I, I don't know how they would describe it, your loyalty to the uh, to the ruling government, uh, because they're following everything you're doing. They're seeing everywhere you go. They they are watching everything you say online and reading everything you write online. Uh, you know that globally, that's an apocalyptic uh, problem. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ron. It's somber, somber thoughts indeed. Thank you for joining us there now, Ron. Um, yeah, I'm a real, I'm a fun guy. Aren't I? <laughs> so we're coming towards the end of the session now. And Bob, maybe I could ask you to leave us with something a little bit more hopeful. In, in what area of this are you hopeful that we are either making progress or that you feel we we can start to make progress i am hopeful from what i am seeing in europe sadly here in the states uh there's very little to make me hopeful but i have been asked to speak to gr groups over in europe uh, i've spoken to uh members of the british parliament i've spoken to uh uh a group uh at the at the uh eu um what is it called the executive something it, it's the it, it's the upper level of the of the eu parliament it's uh uh and uh i i you know I, the, the thing that is hopeful is when i speak to people about this when i speak to people like you guys about this everyone seems to agree that it's a problem everyone seems to agree that we have to do something about it we just haven't coalesced into a group that has the the power or the means to make something happen uh the, the regulatory bodies and the legislative bodies have passed regulations that are hopeful about this. The problem is they haven't been enforced. Regulation without enforcement may as well not be regulation at all. And, you know, we see, and when they are enforced, they're enforced in such ways that the, um, that the criminals don't pay much. You know, they pay a little fine and they move on. It's not, it doesn't really hurt them to break the law. It doesn't really hurt them. We have to make it hurt. And if, if we can make it hurt, then things will change. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It's been an absolute honor to speak with you here today. And it's been so great to have an opportunity to bring your work to bring AdScan to people's attention, because as I say, when I read it, I was just blown away and bored the pants off everybody talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> but uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you today. Um, I hope you won't mind me telling everybody that we had a little chat about your dog before we started <laughs> the conversation. Uh, we, we bonded mm. chatting about dogs. Bob's dog's not very well today, so we wish <laughs> well to Bob's dog. But we do thank all of you for taking the time in your busy day to join us. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, thank you to our founder, Chris Rawlinson, for letting me host this event for 42 Courses. And I hope that you will join us again for other talks. So thank you so much, Bob. If you'd like to just say goodbye to everybody and we'll close the event. 
Luis, thank you for having me on and to everyone who joined today and anyone who's going to listen to this or view it. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your interest in this issue. And I hope you'll join me in trying to do something about it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody who joined us. Have a good afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. And do join us for another event. Bye now. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye.